Come in. Quick, quick. Okay. Um, so, hi, I'm Tim. Um, I first want to start with some disclaimers. I am not a professional FPGA developer. I am a hobbyist. Um, I also have too many projects, and this is some of them. I started in FPGA stuff about 2011 and still going. Um, so I wouldn't say I've been hugely successful, but I have um, managed to get some interesting things done. And most of that has been on the back of other people's work. So I want to say a big thank you to all the people who have done the work that I've built off. Um, there's this kind of saying that um, you're standing on the shoulders of giants, and I actually think that is pretty much true. I did not do this all by myself. I had lots and lots of help. So um, big thank you to them. Um, so there's a thing you should know about me is I love Python. Um, I love Python so much that I started a conference about Python in Australia, um, and that's been going really well. Um, but the other thing is I'm a also very practical. I think you should use the right tool for the right job. It turns out that Python is the right tool for most jobs, but it's not the right tool for every job. And if I talked to you maybe five years ago, I would have said Python programming an FPGA is not the right tool for this job. Nobody's doing this, and it's terrible. <laughs> and I've lost video for a second. Uh -oh. I'm going to keep going. Um, I think it's the connection here. But, um, but now I say yes, that you should do this. Um, and this talk is about convincing you why you should do that. But I want to get into some history about how I started getting into FPGA programming. Um, and so I come from Australia, um, as you might have seen from my accent or heard from my accent. Um, and Australia is actually a really big place. Um, this is Australia overlaid on top of the US. Um, except we have like a very small population, which means there's a long distance to get anywhere, which means that the tech community, which is very small, is spread out. And so I didn't have a lot of peers who were in tech. And I really wanted to help fix that for the next generation of people who were in Australia and couldn't attend use groups and conferences because they're a long way away. And so, I started this project called Tim Videos, and its URL is timvideos.us, so it's Tim Videos Us. Um, and it was about making it easy for people to record and live stream conferences so that people who couldn't make it to the conference were able to still see the content. And I think that's really important because there are plenty of reasons why you might not be able to get to a conference, and I don't think you should be excluded just because you can't make it there physically. And when I started this back, I know, 2009, um, we had a couple of boxes up the front, one that was capturing from a presenter and one which was capturing from a camera, and they started out being um, DV and VGA. And I was quite late to doing this. Carl's been doing it for like ever. Um, Carl's up the back there. Um, and at some point in the last five or six years, um, this thing called HDMI came along. And this put a real like brakes on trying to do this because getting cheap, H reliable HDMI capture hardware was really, really hard and really, really expensive. And then 
In 2011, uh, Bunny gave this talk, which somebody linked me to. I didn't attend it in person or anything. I wasn't cool enough to go to CCC at that point. Um, this talk about this new thing he had developed called the NETV2. Uh, NETV2 one, sorry. This is the first one. And the, this is kind of what you see. And it does a man in the middle between the HDMI input and the HDMI output. And as he said in the morning, it has no capture. But that's because he's working with encrypted content. In my use case, which is at conferences, the data from the presenter's laptop to the projector doesn't have to be encrypted. In fact, if it's encrypted, it probably means you're playing something that I shouldn't be recording anyway. Um, and the same with output from a camera. And so that made me think, what if I did exactly what Bunny said we shouldn't do? And so I created the HDMI to USB project, which takes a HDMI input and a HDMI output, and then produces a nice, clean, digital capture of that up the USB port. But this is only for unencrypted content. If you try and run encrypted content through it, it will just fail and say, no, I can't do that. Um, and the HDMI USB project is basically open source Firmware and hardware for doing conference video capture. And it's been used. Um, and this device is FPGA based. And the reason it's FPGA based is I am a human. And like all humans, I suck. And I write bugs all the time. And so I want to be able to fix my bugs after the I've made them. I want to fix my problems. And so by using FPGA, all my hardware problems are software problems. And software you can update and fix. And so every conference we go to, we find more problems. And then we fix them. And so they don't keep happening. And so this was really awesome. And this hardware is now being used to record a whole bunch of conferences around the world. And it's, in fact, being used to record this conference hopefully, if Carl's got it working. Uh, if it doesn't work, blame Carl, not me. Um, and another thing that I really love is that Bunny is actually using a bunch of the stuff we've developed through this process in his NETV2. So his NETV inspired my project, which then helped his project. So this is really great, awesome, um, open source stuff. But I promised I'd talk about Python. And Python is actually really intimately tied to the story of HDMI to USB. And the reason is, this here is how you do conference capture. You can see there's quite a lot of parts to it. Um, there's a mixing station down here. This is written in Python. Um, there's some capture stuff. These are just Python scripts. Um, there's some cloud stuff that is generally Python. There's a website, which is Django. Um, and I'm talking about Python, so I guess there's Python in the conference. And some people say there are Python in my head. But what about these two things? Um, these were not Python initially. Um, there are two major languages for programming FPGAs, um, Verilog and VHDL. And you might know sis, that these are not Python. <laughs> um, but as I said, I'm a practical person. Use the right tool for the right job. And VHDL and Verilog is what everybody was using in this space. And so I decided to start with that. And so we created some firmware for this dev board. This is called the Digilent Atlas board. It was a base on a mixture of VHDL and Verilog. I couldn't decide which one to use, so we used both. Um, and it only supported this one board. And it almost kind of worked, but not really. Um, 
And it took us about three years to get something that was only basically working, and we still had a huge number of features that we wanted to add to it. As well, the licensing of that firmware was kind of complicated because a lot of it was based off Xilex app notes, which have interesting licensing constraints around it. Um, and then that original digital Atlas board was a dev board, we really wanted a board that was designed for recording conferences and user groups. And so we developed our own piece of hardware that's all open source. You can go and um, like get the full schematics done in KiCad and all that type of thing for this. But this means we had two boards we had to support. And both boards are very similar, but they're not identical. And so the code needed a bunch of refactoring to support both. And both Verilog and VHDL make it really hard to do a system that is mostly the same but isn't. And then after this disappointing progress, I was getting very um, disheartened with this project. And I discovered this thing called MiGen, MISOC, and Litex. And the interesting thing you might notice is that it is Python based. That's the first thing there. It already had HDMI and DVI support. It had DDR, RAM, Ethernet support, and already supported like 20 boards. And so I was like, well, I'm not enjoying where this is going or the progress. Why not give Python a try? Um, and so, I didn't have time to do this myself though, I have a full-time job, so I decided to put some money towards um, this guy called Florent, who lives in France and runs this company called Android Digital, and he rewrote everything that our firmware did in four weeks with a lot more features. Um, I mean, Florent is a much better programmer in VHDL than I am, but even with that in mind, this is a pretty impressive amount of work. And those features were, the device now had buffering, so if the speaker's video went away, we were still sending video, and so your projector wouldn't go to sleep or any of these things. We had proper matrix, it supported model of bores, it had ethernet support, um, it had an inbuilt soft core, which means we had a really nice command line interface. It was actually really awesome if you compare the two features. Um, and to make things even better, the licensing was really clear. It was truly open source. There was no questionable source code in there. It was all written from scratch using none of the vendor provided stuff. And so that was really awesome. And I think this is a real worked example of why Python was the right choice, but it doesn't tell you kind of why this worked. Why was he more productive? Why have we bought into this system when so few other people have? And so let's dive deeper into what this Python system actually gets to you. And so this is where the talk changes to how to be an effective FPGA developer. Even if you don't buy into this Python stuff, if you follow these tips just in your everyday FGA, FPGA development, such as when you're writing Verilog, you'll get a lot further. So um, if you see one of these purple slides, um, take note because you can ignore the rest of the talk. Um, but these slides are the really important ones. Um, so my theory on why doing FPGA development is so hard are these four points. And I'm gonna go through each one. So I think the first major point is that HDL languages are inappropriate for what you're actually trying to do. Um, 
you should be using a programming language to develop hardware. What they, Verilog and VHDL, are hardware description languages. And they're very good at describing hardware. But most of the time, what you're doing is building hardware out of small blocks and plumbing them together. This is not something a hardware description language is good at. This is something that a programming language is good at. Programming languages are very good at building composable components that you can put together to make bigger components. And so, oops, I've skipped ahead. Um, this is what MeGen really does. It doesn't let you take Python and convert it directly HD into like Verilog. It is actually a system that makes it very easy to generate a whole bunch of Verilog. You can kind of think of it as just an easy way to write a lot of Verilog very quickly. And here's a simple example. There are two things in um, MeGen that Bunny pointed out this morning. They're combinational statements, which you can think of as effectively just connecting a wire between two locations. They're effectively the same thing electrically. So when you say A equal to B, A and the B can never be different. They're always the same value. And there are synchronous statements, and these things happen on a clock edge. And so in this case, A is set to B when the clock ticks. And so this is a blinking LED example. Um, in the middle, we have a counter. Every time it's a synchronous statement, so every time there's a clock tick, the counter is equal to the counter minus one. That's pretty simple. Then there's a combinational statement which says set the LED equal to the highest bit. That's what that negative one, if you're not used to Python, negative one is like the last thing in the index. And so the highest, the most significant bit to be equal to the LED. And so that means when this is one, the LED will be on, and when this is zero, the LED will be off. And this is really simple because Python's a powerful, productive language and can generate just the Verilog that you need for this. For example, we created this signal called counter, and we said that this signal will be at most this many cycles big. Um, and signal is automatically sized to be big enough to fit that number. You don't need to worry about how many bits this is, whether it's five bits or 30 bits. You just know that it will be big enough to fit the cycles. As well, if I want to extend this, say I want to take in a bunch of LEDs, I can take in a list of LEDs, and then for each LED, I can set them to the top value. And so they will know all sync in unison. Um, and this is very logical. It's, you don't have to do some type of weird generate statement. It's just a simple for loop. And so this is why I believe a language like Python, a proper programming language, is really good to generate Verilog. And I believe Python is a really good language for this because Python is designed to be a glue language that you connect lots of things together. And so this is my first tip for you. Use a programming language, not a HDL language, to describe your FPGA hardware. Because most of the time, you're not building explicit registers and very low level things. You're building higher level things that you want to be able to reuse in multiple places. So that's the first one. But I had four points. And so what about these middle two? Well, 
I just think writing hardware is fundamentally actually reasonably hard. There are a lot of things you need to think about and a lot of things you need to get right. And it's also quite slow. So let's just do less of that. Let's write less hardware. And the best way to write less hardware is to use a CPU because that's already a piece of hardware that we know works. But the FPGAs I tend to work with don't have a CPU in them because I'm cheap and I don't want to pay for one. So instead, I use a soft CPU. And a soft CPU is awesome because you get to write your code in C, you can compile it with GCC, and you can update it easily. The type of programs I'm writing in C compile in like microseconds, and I can upload them into the FPGA much, much faster than I could even compile a blinking LED example for the gateway. I don't need to update the gateway. I have the same gateway, but I just modify the C code. And this is really awesome because a lot of things you want to do, for example, are command line interfaces. Um, this command line interface is terrible to do in Verilog, but it's a pretty trivial C program. It's like, um, you know how the second C program you probably did was like an adventure game? This is just like an adventure game. And that compiles like faster than you can hit the up arrow. Um, and MeGen gives you a system on chip which has a soft CPU and it has all the parts that you need to connect a soft CPU to the hardware that you're developing automatically. So um, it also gives you the choice of soft CPU. You can have an LM32, or you can have an open risk one k or you can have a RISC-V, and your code doesn't care. It's agnostic to the architecture that you're using. So you might choose one because it's got better performance, or you might choose another one because it has a different profile for your chip. Or you might be really space constrained, so you choose the architecture that is the smallest. You might want performance, so you choose the architecture that gives you the best. And none of your code has to change because it generates basically C code stubs that let you write code, C code, that is agnostic to how the architecture actually implements these features. And so back to a simple example, if I was following what I said, is what I really want is just a GPIO register that I can write to, and it turns the LED on, and then I can write a while loop, right? And so this is what it looks like in MESOC. I have an I.O. module that I've told has automatic registers that you can read and write from the CPU, and that it has a GPIO out module that I've given an LED, and then I can write this teeny little C program here where I just type IO write LEDs, and then I have a sleep function, and then I write again. Um, this is a very simple C program, and this name is auto-generated based on the code above. So this is really powerful. Is there a question at the back? Yes. Yes, almost. There's a teeny little bit more like you have to have some includes on the C program, but like, yeah. And so, as I said, this creates a GPIO register, and then this is an auto-generated C function that you can call. Yes? How does the use sleep work? Um, the CPU comes with an inbuilt timer, and so it's basically waiting for the time to count so many things, I believe. Or it might be just cycle-based. I'm not quite sure. Um, I've never needed to look into it. That's auto-generated as well. Uh, it comes as part of the standard library that MESOC shifts with. And a real example of this is that when you have DDR code, you need to do training to bring up the DDR for the first time. Um, this is a reasonably complicated pro uh, process where there are lots of error cases that you're supposed to handle. 
And doing this as a state machine in Verilog is possible. I have seen it. Um, I have no idea how they managed to make it work. Whereas in C, it's actually really easy. And it turns out that the Verilog code for doing this training uses more resources than our soft CPU. So we can write our soft CPU, um, uh, our SRAM in it, in our soft CPU, and get a free soft CPU just for needing to do the DDR training. There are little downsides. You do need GCC and bin utils as an extra thing. I try to make this very easy. There's a thing called the Litex build environment that will ship you all the tools you need if you're running on Linux. Um, this is still C though, it's not Python. Um, so who here knows what MicroPython is? Um, for those who don't, MicroPython is a Python implementation that is so small that it makes you question how small things can be. Um, and so we have a project called Foopy, which takes the exact same process and lets you run MicroPython on your sock that you auto-generate and get auto-generated Python methods in the same way that you have C. So you could write your firmware in Python running on a sock that's generated from Python. Um, so the big thing here, though, is you should do as little as you can in the FPGA. Anything you can push on to the soft CPU, do. Anything that you can push on to the host computer connected to, do, because the less you have to write, the more time you're going to have to do cool things rather than trying to debug a Verilog state machine that has got 400 states in it. So that's really awesome. Um, but sometimes you're going to have to write hardware to get your things done. Otherwise, why are you using FPGA? You should just use a Raspberry Pi. Um, and Raspberry Pi Zero is like super cheap. Um, so use that if you can. Um, and writing hardware is hard, and it's very slow and hard to debug. So what you really want to do is increase your ability to see what's going on inside FPGA. And this is what an inside of an FPGA looks when you're running on MESOC. You've got a CPU, you've got a bus, probably got a bunch of memory interfaces, then you've got a thing that connects the CSR bus and there's a bunch of peripherals which have the CSR on them. Um, and this is kind of what's inside your sock. And you get all of this with a couple of lines of Python. But most of the time, the only thing you care about is the peripheral you're working on at the moment. And the peripheral needs to be controlled by a computer, but there's a very powerful computer sitting right next to your FPGA that's much more powerful than the soft CPU you've put in the um, device. So why don't we just use that instead of your CPU? You can attach GDB to things running on your computer. You can't do that easily to things inside the soft CPU necessarily. So in Litex, we have built a bunch of bridges that let you write and run programs on your developer computer and talk directly onto the wishbone bus. So you can effectively throw out the CPU in the FPGA and just have this bridge and then write the code on your computer. And we support a whole bunch of different interfaces for doing the connectivity. You could use a UART if you like being slow, but we also support Ethernet, both 100, gigab uh, 100 megabit Ethernet, 10 megabit Ethernet, and gigabit Ethernet. We also support PCI Express, and this lets the host 
talk over what interface you have available to the wishbone bus and gives you a very high bandwidth way of figuring out what the hell is going on. And because I love Python, um, we have a Python library that makes it very easy to do that. You just import the LiTeX stuff, you start up a remote client, you open it, and then you can write to various register uh, memory locations with various values, and you can read them, which is kind of cool, but um, I'm lazy, I can never remember where things are going to be located. So we have useful things like the fact that the wb.mems gives you a mem map, and the wb.regs gives you the name of all the registers, and you can call like wishbone regs io module leds dot write, and it will turn the LED on. And it doesn't matter whether it's using PCI or Etherbone or any of these type of things, it's the same type of interface. And because Python is awesome, you can install something like IPython or BPython or Jupyter Notebooks, and you get tab completion. You get tab completion on your register names that you can read and write to. So increasing the inspectability in the FPGA makes it much quicker to figure out what's going wrong. If you have a question like, well, has the PLL locked? You can read the register that has the PLL locked bit in it and see whether it's a one or zero. This is much quicker than trying to, you know, get out an oscilloscope and map the signal out and all this type of thing. It's just a standard piece of software. And I've actually got mostly working so that SIGROC can automatically find your definition of, we have this thing called LightScope. LightScope gives you a digital virtual um, oscilloscope. And so you can fire up SIGROC and it will connect automatically to the light scope to find in the gateway, and you can read the samples out of it like you had a logic analyzer attached to the internals of your FPGA. And as you can imagine, that is super useful. So, yay. Um, that helps with a lot of things, but it turns out FPGA toolchains are really, really slow. So you should reduce the hardware that you even put on the FPGA. Um, the reason FPGA toolchains are slow is because the problem it's actually solving is quite hard. It's mapping your arbitrary description of some random hardware to a physically constrained system. It's like trying to solve the traveling salesman for a whole bunch of salesmen at the same time which don't really know what they're doing. So um, it's actually really hard. And so that the more code you have, the slower the compile is. And the more congested the FPGA is, the longer it's going to take to run. And if you remember, this is what I said was inside the FPGA. That's quite a bit of stuff. Um, it's definitely more than a blinking LED. Um, and that means that your code's going to take longer, uh, there's more code, and it's going to take slower to compile. But what you really care about is just the peripheral you're working on at this moment. You've got probably a whole bunch of stuff that works like the spy flash and the DDR and the ROM and a bunch of other peripherals that you copied from somebody else that you know work. Um, so you can get rid of all the memory interfaces because you don't need them at the moment. You've got plenty of memory on your computer that you can use instead. You can get rid of all the other peripherals. And so what you're left with is just a bridge and the peripheral you're working on. So in the, blink, uh, ble in the LED blinking case, you've just got the bridge and a single GPIO register. It turns out that is a lot less hardware which means you have a lot less code, which means the thing compiles faster. Um, it's not unheard of to have 30 plus minute compile times in FPGA development land. Um, we get frustrated when it hits five. Um, and with this um, 
Florent, who works on things like the PCI core, um, is able to compile and do an iteration cycle on the orders of minutes rather than hours he had to do previously because it's only ever doing one thing at one time. So you should reduce the hardware that is on the FPGA as much as possible when you're working on something. Just concentrate just on the thing that you're doing. So that is all awesome. And in summary, what Meijin gives you and how to be an effective FPGA developer is that you should use a programming language. You should reduce the hardware you, you write. You should increase your ability to inspect what's happening inside the FPGA. And you should work on small bits at the same time, which if you're a software developer, um, these kind of make sense to you. You should like reduce the amount of software you write. You should have debugging tools like printf. And you should try and keep all your modules small and not end up with 100,000 lines of spaghetti code. And all these things are reasons why FPGAs are hard at the moment. But there's one really big thing I haven't talked about. And that is that FPGA tool chains are currently closed. I believe, personally, this is a major reason we're not seeing people develop new interesting things like MeGen. I don't think MeGen is the best or the pinnacle of how things could be. It's definitely a lot better than what I've done previously, but I can still see there's a huge way to go. And I believe these closed tool chains are really what's stopping us. And so let's talk about the future. I'm contributing to an open source project, as I said, I have too many projects, um, called SimbiFlow. And SimbiFlow's goal is to be the GCC for FPGAs. This is a tool chain that works across multiple different FPGAs, that's open source, that's accessible. And we've already got lots of interesting progress. Um, there was Project iStorm by Clifford Wolf, who um, proved that you could do a lot of this stuff by creating a full open source toolchain for the latter size 40. But there's a bunch of stuff in there that is a bit basic. Um, and the ICE 40 is a small FPGA. So then there was Project X-Ray, which is looking at the Xilex Series 7, like the RTEC 7. And there's Project Trellis, which is started by TinyFPGA over there, who's looking at the ECP5 series. Um, we have pretty much a working tool chain for the i40. We have some demos that show how to blink an LED on um, the RTEC 7. And the ECP5 work is coming along really quickly. And these are all on the same tool chain. So this is one tool chain that can target two different manufacturers devices. Because it turns out FPGAs are very similar inside. Um, and this is kind of what it makes up. You've got Yosis, written by Clifford, who's the leader of the SimbiFlow project. And then we're using a thing called Verilog to routing to do the place and route. Um, instead of cotton seeds, I think it's pronounced the Rachna PNR. Um, Verilog to routing is an industrial string. Um, place and route tool that is actually being forked multiple times to become a place and route tool for people like Altera. Um, it's obviously had a lot of work um, put into it and a lot of cutting edge research in it. And what we've been doing is taking it from being an academic project and making it target real FPGAs. And you may have seen me hacking on my laptop. I was hoping to have a little demo that showed it working on the ICE 40, but I kind of broke it um, last night at 2 a.m. and haven't fixed it again yet. Um, but this isn't a small project. We really need your help to make this project work. Just like GCC isn't a small project, um, this isn't a small project as well. And so if you're interested in like 
changing the future for FPGAs. Even if you've not done anything in FPGAs, you're a newbie, um, I'm sure I can figure out a way to use your time that is productive for both of us. Um, maybe you want to learn how to do stuff. I'm sure having people look at things like writing tutorials or helping and improve our CI system or our documentation or our website. Um, there is a whole bunch of different things that we could use your help with. And you don't need hardware to contribute. However, people who have contributed tend to find hardware turn up on their doorstep. <laughs> so come and contribute and you might find a care package from me. Um, so this I think is the most important slide in this whole talk. That is SimbiFlow project. I honestly believe if we can get a GCC for FPGAs um, happening, it will dramatically change how we think about compute because an FPGA is truly a general purpose compute unit even more than a CPU is. A CPU can't well, CPU can almost pretend to be an FPGA, but a very, very slow one. Um, whereas an FPGA can definitely pretend to be a CPU. I just talked about it. Um, and so you can do a lot of interesting things. So I'd really love you to help come help change the future. And we already have a lot of work for these FPGAs. If none of those interest you, we would love to see Spartan 6 or Spun 3 support. Um, or any other. We've not got no Altera parts there. We'd love to see Altera stuff um, as well. Um, and as you might guess, a lot of it's written in Python. <laughs> so that is mostly the end of the talk. Um, in summary, this is what Litex and Mijin give you. Um, and that's what happens when you connect snakes with pythons, no, pythons with bunnies, I guess. Um, and you can see that the NETV2 project is using a bunch of our um, stuff, and that's been really awesome. Um, so, yes. And this is what happens, ah, why did it do that? When you get your video encoder wrong. Um, I can also talk about more things. Um, and I had a whole bunch more slides in case I ran out of time, but I think I'm going to take questions instead. And if you're interested in linking to this talk or reading this talk more, um, this link, which is at the bottom of every slide, um, is where you can go to find out more. Um, you had your hand up for a long time. My main question is how much is this is Python and it's in um, A lot of it's C++. Um, Verilog to routing and Yosis are mostly C++. Um, most of the FPGA decoding stuff is written in Python and Tickle because um, the vendor tools are primarily scripted with Tickle because they're stuck in the 1980s. Um, but we try and use as minimal amount of Tickle as possible and mostly use Python um, for doing the generation of designs that we run through to try and understand what the bitstream, um, how the bitstream works. And we're very much trying to document the bitstream we are not trying to reverse engineer the internals of Vivado. We've not attached any type of debugger to Vivado. We just give it designs that are valid and produce bit streams and then do a correlation between the input and output. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the approach we're taking. Um, and I've gotten a bunch of advice that this is the best way to proceed um, I really hope that the FPGA vendors see that this is going to help them sell a lot more FPGAs. 
because um, I know if I had a GCC for FPGAs, I'd be using a lot more FPGAs today already. Um, and so hopefully they will see that, but history kind of says they won't. Um, Yep, so the comment was that every time, um, sorry, I don't know your name, Ryan has seen um, toolchains and got to the proprietary stage, he's just turned around and not done anything with FPGAs. And I think that is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Um, if I didn't need the high speed um, stuff that I do for the video processing in an FPGA, I probably would have done the same. Um, there were questions up the back. Um, Luke? Okay, um, my gen is the HDL, and then there are two compatible um, system on chip implementations. There's MESOC and there's LITEX. Um, MESOC is kind of a soft fork of LITEX that, uh, sorry, LITEX is a soft fork of MeGen that includes a bunch more experimental stuff and a bunch of stuff that hasn't made it up into MESOC. MESOC could kind of be thought of as the upstream for LITEX, um, but they want to keep their core quality high, whereas in LITEX we're more willing to um, do interesting things quicker. Um, so that's kind of the difference between the two. Um, it should be mostly just a search and replace these days to switch between the two. You replace LightX in a few places with MESOC and all of a sudden you're switched. Um, and yeah, we don't want the two communities to fork too much. Um, I heavily use LightX, um, but other people heavily use MESOC um, and we share a lot of developers and code and cores and we both are now based on MeGen. Um, so, yeah. Person in the red shirt. Um, so, you basically are able to divide, uh, able to have multiple clock domains in one module. Um, I forget exactly what it looks like because a lot of time you take two modules that are in different clock domains and you just use a simple CDC module like a FIFO and it automatically understands that these two things are in different clock domains and is able to deal with the clock domain crossing for you or you set up a, um, a like multi-FIFO, uh, multi-register type thing it has support for doing that type of thing. Um, so generally you try and keep most of your modules to one clock domain and you can late bind it to a clock domain. So you could have a module and in one design you bind it to the system clock, in another design you bind it to um, a peripheral clock that is running at a different speed to the clock domain um, that the system's running in. And you just put then a CDC type primitive between the two depending on what you're after. And it's very easy to do that because Python lets you go, if the clock domain between these two things I'm connecting together is the same clock domain, just connect them together. If it's not, put in a FIFO or put in a some other type of system. You can write code like that in your Python and it enables you to um, reuse your modules a lot easier because when you're writing a module, you're not thinking, ah, oh, this is in the system clock domain. You're writing a module and then at some point it gets bound to be in a clock domain and that's when you start thinking about, oh, I need to get data in and out from that clock domain. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question over here. Um, so I have a CI system that builds stuff. Um, testing is an area that I would love to know more about. Um, I generally don't do a huge amount of testing except on the real FPGA and proving that works. Um,
Carl has been trying to set up a system which actually tests the real functionality, like it flashes a new firmware to the FPGA and checks that the video in and out work, um, because ultimately that's what really matters, does the video in and out work. Um, they have a bunch of simulation stuff, um, but I haven't been heavily involved in the testing of cores. I've mostly been involved in the plumbing cores together type area. So in that kind of level, you do a lot less of explicit testing. Um, Um, not as much as I'd like, and I think this is one thing that could improve quite a lot. The proprietary tools do prevent a lot of um, your ability to do a lot of this on CI without complicated systems because of licensing, right? Um, so I'm hoping that will get better as we start seeing um, more open source tools in this area. Icarus and Verilator are two open source simulators that are work very well with um, Migen and Litex. Um, for example, you can bring up a full Ethernet SOC with a serial UART in Verilator and Icarus, and like it runs fast enough that you can type like interactive stuff in it, and you can ping it through the virtual Ethernet interface and that type of thing. So you can do a lot more um, uh, ad hoc testing rather than rigorous testing, which has its upsides and its downsides, obviously. Um, so yeah, I would like more testing. Um, I've started playing with Coco TB recently, and I feel like that could match very well because it's also a Python-based system. Um, but yeah, testing is nowhere near where I'd like it to be, um, but we're working on trying to improve that. You should also check out LibreCores. They're working on trying to make a automated CI system for any HDL testing, whether it's Python-based MiGen or some other thing. Um, so um, LibreCores, um, definitely sign up for their newsletter, there's lots of interesting things there about the progress they're making. I don't know, I haven't actually played with it yet. As I said, I have too many projects and the one I've been really concentrating on at the moment is the SymbiFlow stuff. Um, at some point I really want to get back to doing video stuff, um, especially since Bunny is now using it and so I have to keep my promises I made to him. Um, so, yeah, thank you. And I think I'm probably out of time now. Um, I've got like three minutes, so I'm going to let you leave three minutes early. Thank you very much. <laughs>